Good morning. Um, good morning. I'm here to present uh, Professor Maria Robinson, who is coming from uh, Bishop Grosetest University in the United Kingdom. And Professor Robinson is going to talk us about uh, contentious technologies that may be used by uh, students, uh, by a professor in, the, in their classes while um, they are teaching or trying to teach a student things that may be not related to social media and may be not related what, uh, to their, their world that uh, really today is technologies and it may be very far from what uh, the professor is used to talk to them. So uh, let's uh, listen to Professor Robinson. Uh, thank you very much for being here today with us. And I would like to start by thanking you for the invitation and for the hospitality. It has been wonderful to be with you, to hear about the interesting projects that are going on under this Erasmus Congress heading, and to have a chance to see a really beautiful city. I need to start as well with some apologies for those of you who are from Girona, that I really don't speak much Catalan. I did ask a friend, and she said she thought some useful phrases would be gracias, Barça, uh, Camp Nou, is that, am I saying that right? And Carlos Carlos Puyol, Carlos Puyol, she says, is, with all of that, I should be okay. So, Susplau, be gentle with me. A little bit about my background. Um, my PhD, many years ago, was about children and television and reading, looking at the ways in which children made sense of narrative in both media and arguing that many of the skills they needed were the same. They needed to empathize, to predict, to understand the context, to engage with characters. And that rather than fearing television and seeing it as an enemy, we should see television and reading as two ways to learn about story. From there, I went on to do more research in new media, digital literacies more generally. And currently, I am this wonderful thing called an emeritus professor which means I'm retired, I don't have to work, and I can do bits of research that I want to. Uh, until I retired, I was the vice chancellor, that's the president of Bishop Grosteste University, so much of my time was taken up with leadership, and the research has always been the delight, the extra that I get to enjoy. I am still supervising some PhDs and engaging in our research networks. But this is the first conference for a while, so it's really good to be here. I also bring apologies from Professor Carrington. We should have been doing this together. Um, she is much more current than me. She is a professor at University of East Anglia. But she's Australian. She works in the UK with a visa, and she has visa problems. However digital our world is, when it comes down to it, there are bits of paper that matter. So she is stuck in the UK sorting out her passport. And personally, I think I'm very much a both and person in terms of media. Somebody yesterday said, you don't get addicted to reading. Well, I disagree. I read everything, serial packets. If I can't find something to read, it will be something like that. But I use Facebook, I use Messenger, I use Twitter a bit. Interesting, very few of you are using the Twitter feed during these sessions. It's there for you. I'm on LinkedIn, but I wouldn't say I use it. I don't really understand it, but it's there. Email, traditional print, books, Kindle, TV, DVD, you name it, I'll use it. So, come on, we can move on. Yeah, contentious technologies. I want to argue that actually every technology starts by being suspected and seen as contentious. If you go back far enough, people thought books were dangerous, the printing press was seen as dangerous, cinema, television, all the stages of the digital revolution. We have to see these technologies not as good or bad, but as something to explore. There will be always difficulties using new technologies in schools, as well as strengths.
but we do have to acknowledge that must, much of the suspicion and hostility has always come from schools and universities, those of us that you might think would be most open to new learning. And in today's presentation, I particularly want to explore these contentious technologies through a concept of wicked issues. This is something that comes from the work of Professor Sir David Watson, who was Vice Chancellor at the University of Brighton. And he was talking about leadership in higher education more generally, in saying there are always some issues where there really is never going to be an answer. And all we can do is keep on exploring all aspects of the question. A very simple example there, well, we had one yesterday actually, the kitchen knife, a perfect example of something which can be a benefit and a danger and it's always going to be both. He would say for a university, one of those issues is always parking. There is never enough parking. People want to use cars. We also have a concern for the environment, so we want to discourage them. If we discourage them, they park somewhere even more inconvenient for other people. There is no solution. We just have to go on working towards the best way forward. And much of media, I think, is like that. Some of these emerging issues, actually, I won't be going here very much, but I wanted to touch on, are about ownership. Who owns these technologies? Some of you will have been following the Apple iPhone unlocking debate. You know, in the States, you have the security forces saying to Apple, help us to get into this phone. It belongs to a terrorist. There are things we need to know. And Apple saying, if we do that, everybody can get into our security, and that is bad for everybody else who owns an iPhone. And maybe that was quite easy for us to take a side on when we're thinking of the big brother of the state against the individual and Apple with this very individualistic side. But then I also came across this cutting. I've been doing some traditional content analysis as part of my preparation. All my cuttings are from one week of one newspaper in the UK. And this was in Italy, a grieving father in Italy who has written to Tim Cook, Apple's chief executive, to beg him to unblock his dead son's iPhone so he can retrieve the photographs stored on it. So his son has died, the photos are on the phone, the father, although he was apparently given access, can no longer get it. And there we start to think, oh, well, how sad. But of course, we still don't know the full story. Did his son really give him access? Did he want him to have this? And again, even if Apple say yes to this and no to the security systems, it's the same problem. If they write the code to get into this phone, then none of our phones are as safe. And you start to see the challenges around ownership. But also the challenge of change is nothing new. And here I hold my breath and hope that this is going to work. Ja, det er deg, ja. Ja, så bra, ok. Ja, hei du. Hei du. Ja. Ja, hva gjelder det? Ja, det er det her. Ja, vil du sitte? Takk. Ja. Ja, så den, jeg har ikke fått gjort noen ting hele formiddag, ja. Nei, jeg beklager at det tar tid, altså. Skjønner vi holder på å legge om til et helt nytt system, og da skal alle ha hjelp på en gang, vet du. Ja, ja. Så du kommer ikke inn i den, eller? Nei, den bare ligger der. Ok, har du forsøkt å åpne den? Ja, åpne den, altså. Hvis det hadde vært så enkelt, så hadde jeg jo ikke tilkalt hjelp til det, skal det vel? Nei, det er sant. Nei, nei. Du har gått på en fond? Nei, det skal være fort gjort, det er det jeg vil se. Du bare gjør... Der. Sånn. Ja. Da er du i gang. Ja, altså, så langt kom jeg også. Ok. Men så stoppet det opp, og så var jeg redd for at noe av teksten skulle forsvinne, så jeg turte ikke å gå videre. Å ja, ok. Nei, men du skjønner at inni her, så ligger det kanskje flere hundre sider med lagret tekst. Så for å komme videre, så tar du tak i ett og ett ark, på den måten her, og så blar du over på neste side, sånn. Da fortsetter teksten der. Jeg blar, altså. Du blar, ja. Men når jeg skal tilbake, da? Ja, da bare blar du tilbake igjen. Tar tak der, og så gjør du sånn. Der, så er du tilbake til den teksten du hadde, sa jeg. Ok, så den slutter der, og så 
så fortsätter den där ja. Okej, okay, men men när när jag ska avsluta för dagen vad gör jag då? Da? Ja, bara slår du samman permene. Ja. På den måten där. Så. Där er lukket där ligger allt lagret inne där. Jag ser inte säkert kan miste något av texten här nu alltså. Allt ligger lagret inne här nu. Ja. Det tillfället sitter fyr på eller grad det är er kanske lite sannsynligt så. Ja, okej. Okay. Nej, men för det är er nog med det att liksom när du håller på med 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 skriftruller ja. så så tar det lite grann tid och 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 konvertera till att blå i en i en bok. Ja. Mm. Ja. Ja, jag har gått till bit. Då är det. Ja, för ja, men du en till för för det går. Vi bara gå igenom en, en gång till. Alltså jag jag öppnar. Ja. Sån. Ja, vet du. Och så vad du kallade det? Blar. Jag blar. Ja, blar vid det. Blar fram och tillbaka. Ja. Och när den ligger där helt. Ligger ja. Och när jag när jag ska är er färdig så bara lukkar jag den. Ja, ikke. Flott. Fint det. Jättefint. Ja, flott det. Ja, men du, nej, nej, men, ikk sant? Nu är den sån igen, nu får jag köpa den. Kan se? Nu får jag köpa den. Ja, du har den på fel sida. Du har den öppna med öppna från från andra sidan. Så det är er inte lika gult det alltså. Nej, öppna från den sidan där, sån där. Där är något. Ja väl. Har du okay. läst manualen eller? Manualen. Det ska följa med som manualen som brukar vara ledig. Det sitter den där. Där vet du. Och ja, I den står allt samma. Ja. Ja, men ikvant där har du samma problem. Mm. Får ni upp? Få upp det. Okej, okay, det skulle vi kanske ha tänkt på. And you may think that's what happens to us old people, but actually the young are not exempt from this either. And now we need to go to... It's a camera. I already know it. An old school camera. An old camera. I think. Pretty ugly. It's big. <laughs> I've never seen a camera like this in real life. Does this thing have any batteries? I did something. How do I turn? Ah. I'll suck this thing. Old time selfie. I've always wanted to see film. It's like a battery. I have to find out what I'm supposed to do with this. Why did things have to be so hard back then? Leave it out? No. I hope there's like a YouTube tutorial video for this or something. That'd be great. Here we go, people. Who knew taking a picture could be such hard work? All right, now you can take a picture. Awesome. (laughs) Okay, so... Where's the picture? You'd have no idea how they turned out until you brought it to a store. Oh, come on. You're not making me walk to a store now, are you? Then, you'd have to wait at least an hour for them to develop the film. What would you do while waiting? And you had to pay for the store to do that. Mm. Uh. You bad for those people. Us. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> Did you live with this back then? You must be really old. Just how hard it is. To just take a simple picture. You see, these problems still exist. We still all struggle with technology. We still have things we can and can't do. And sometimes the older systems can be more reliable. Okay, this picture uh, hangs in the upstairs window of my hairdressers in Lincoln. This big pair of scissors has been a sign for a hairdressers for hundreds and hundreds of years. It just hangs there every day, in and out, and we all know what it means. It doesn't need new batteries, it doesn't have to be updated, it doesn't break down. You can just see behind it, you see this black square? That is the electronic notice board over the theater over the road. And on this occasion, it was blank. I've been watching it over a couple of years when I sit looking out of that window. And I would say about 80% of the time the information is out of date. 
and about 10% there's none. So maybe one time in 10, it has information about things that are going to be on at the theatre in the future, and it's right. So clearly there is a huge problem sometimes with new technologies. Some people say with new technologies that what we need to do in schools is to get children to learn to code. If they learn to code, they know how these things work, we will have no problems. But actually, I think there is a challenge in here. Um, and uh, to some of the things that would go along with this. Julia Davis in the UK has done some research about teenage girls who learned to code by themselves, not at school. They were using some software called Babies, which is a kind of game where you adopt babies virtually and you look after them online. And what these girls did was to find out how to get into the code behind the babies. First, I think, with innocent intentions to make extra clothes for them or change the color of their hair. But then they realized they could make the babies green or do awful things to them. And there was quite a debate in the babies' community. But the girls showed if they wanted to do it, they found out how to do it, and they did it. It wasn't because they did it at school. But, and we would think, well, that's great, you know, young people showing independence. Some of you will have seen the recent news story about Microsoft and its chatbot. This is an artificial intelligence chatbot called Tay, uh, which they put out, and the idea was meant to be it would learn how to talk because we talked to it. The trouble was that straight away, people realized they could teach it to say bad things, a bit like brothers and sisters teaching their younger children, the younger children in the family to say the words that will get them into trouble. And they had to close it down because it says the learning experiment, which got a crash course in racism, Holocaust denial, and sexism, courtesy of Twitter users, um, had to be removed. And although they tried putting it back briefly, the same thing happened again. I suspect we feel less comfortable about people learning to use technology in those ways. I found an article um, online, came up in LinkedIn, the first time I've ever found it useful, um, which suggested that actually learning to code offers diminishing returns. The more that people learn how to code, the more that the technologies will come up with automatic solutions which make them redundant. Just the same as at the moment in the UK in supermarkets, we are encouraged to use the self-checkout tills. Have you got these hideous things here? Yeah? Okay, so there's a till and you have to scan things yourself and pay. And the argument was, oh, we won't employ fewer staff because we need them there to help you. But of course, in a few years, we will all know how to use these desks. And then what happens to the staff? The more we invent clever things to do with technology, the more technology manages to do without us. And yes, the same week, the very day before, in the paper, manufacturers press ministers to help fill the skills gap. We aren't producing enough people who know how to code and who know how to make things work. So as teachers, what do we do? On the one hand, if we'd say we want them to know how this technology works, we have a challenge because it's not easy, is it, learning to do that? And we are giving people a power that may actually enable them to do things we don't like. Or it might actually mean that we are building in this obsolescence where they will end up out of work. So do we do it or do we not do it? There really isn't an easy answer. Some of you will have come across Prensky's work talking about digital natives and digital immigrants. Yesterday we were talking about the transmedia generation. It's the same kind of thing. And Reingold in his work talked about early adopters. And I have noticed that Prensky's terms have very much caught the popular imagination. I would argue they are actually less than helpful in moving us on. And 
the idea is basically you've got the natives who are very comfortable with all of this stuff and then us poor immigrants who really are going to always struggle. Harry Dyer, who is one of Victoria's uh, Carrington's PhD students, recently did a, a TED talk. And just at the end of it, if I can get to the right place, he argues that this is not very helpful for teachers. I have to wait for it to load. And then fast forward it. Come on a bit further. Take it with me anyway. He'll come to it in a minute. It's just. Oh, it's gone too far now. That's it, right. Come on, take it. Just give it a moment. Technology, such a joy. While we wait for it to load, I'll just say, so Prensky says, our students today are all native speakers of the digital lan language of computers, video games, and the internet. I thought one of the interesting things was the presentation we saw first thing, where we saw how positive and negative issues were being seen by those young people. They could see the strengths and the weaknesses. They were not just unenthusiastic adopters. Mm -hmm. no, I think okay, yeah. this talk, the reaction to this by some people is to try and prop up this wall. We need to vote. To try and reinforce and plug the holes and say, no, offline ideals are much better than online ideals. Our established ways of talking are much better than your... Our understanding is much better than your newer understandings. As educators, we can't do that. We can't spend our energy and time propping up this wall and plugging the holes. We can pull it down. We can let it fade. We can say, how can we use social media to address decade-old problems in education? How can we understand older issues? We can show them Shakespeare via tweets. We can show them Ginsberg and Camus via Vine. We can show them artists that are hard to conceptualize via Instagram and Snapchat. We can show them issues that are incredibly hard to talk about, like sex ed and drugs via their peers on YouTube rather than via their teachers. We can encourage this. The more that we build a wall between the online and the offline, the more that we keep education in an established offline place, is the more that we ignore the skills that they have, the increasingly relevant skills that they have in their lives, that they're growing online, the ability to talk about self succinctly, the ability to express identity, the ability to show yourself reflectively, I have problems cutting this talk down to around nine minutes, but they can express themselves in 140 characters in a six-second video, in a single image with a filter. And this is great. This is fantastic, and we shouldn't be putting our energy into desperately trying to stop the flood of the online into the educational system. We should be encouraging these skills. We should be encouraging the use of social media. There's no point using terms like digital natives and hiding behind digital immigrants and saying no. We don't understand social media. That's untrue. They didn't understand social media when they first came to it. We all learn. We learn together. And we can use social media via our rules. We can use social media via our understanding and help them to grow their skills in social media. Thank you very much. An equal myth is the digital immigrants, which for Prensky would be most of the people in this room. If I look at the way that iPhones and iPads in particular have been seized upon by the older generation, then I think we have a very different world emerging. The first early adopters I came across, particularly of the iPad, were largely male vice chancellors so in their late 50s and early 60s of British universities who were all vying with each other to be the first to have this new toy in the meeting with their iPhone as well 
so they could show how busy they were multitasking and listening. But actually, I've seen an awful lot of retired people who use iPads a great deal in a way that they would not have used laptops. They are using FaceTime to talk to their grandchildren, they're reading the newspaper, they're doing the crossword. They're finding the things that they want to do with it, and they are doing them with confidence. That's not really showing such a gap between native and immigrants. And there's a famous um, BBC reporter, and he presents a program called Mastermind, who is, um, I would say, probably in his late 60s. And again, in the paper, he's saying he hates Twitter, he doesn't do Facebook, and he likes to read at a Victorian lectern, you know, a stand. But what he's reading on that is his I from his iPad. He prefers to read on the iPad now. Um, he has music on his laptop. He uses technology the way that he wants to do what he wants. He says, I've been online 10 to 15 years. It's a wonderful way to access information. So I'm not outside that world. Please don't give that impression. So just because people don't do one thing, like Facebook or Twitter, doesn't mean they're not confident with the things they do. And we've seen the younger generation with a competence gap, the cameras, yeah? Give them something new, they don't know what to do. I think my other problem is these terms imply an unhelpful universality, like everybody of any age group is going to feel the same about technology. We don't. You will have friends who never use it, who use it more than you, who are the people you ask when something is broken, the people you help fix it. That's just the way it is. It's really not that different for young people. And some of the research we did with students showed this. There's also an issue about access and entitlement. You know, can you afford the technology? Will your parents pay for broadband? Do you live in a country where that's even possible? Do you live in a country where the government allows access? And I think we need to remember those things as well. But actually, I think immigrants sometimes can be more skillful. One of the things I do in my retirement is I'm something called a deputy lieutenant. Each county in England has a Lord Lieutenant who is the Queen's representative in the county and who wanders around shaking people's hands and, you know, being the sort of social face of the Queen at events. And the Lord Lieutenant has a team of 30 or 40 deputies, and when he can't go to something, we may get to. One of the things we do for him are the citizenship ceremonies. We have quite a lot of people who come to the UK and want to become British citizens. Before they get to the ceremony and get to swear an oath and shake hands, they have to, fill, they have to do an exam. As a result, these immigrants often know far, far more about how our country works than those of us who were born there, the natives. We haven't had to learn those things, so we haven't bothered. They've had to. They've actually had to swear an oath of loyalty to the Queen. We haven't. So just to assume that because somebody's an immigrant, they are in some way less, I think is also unhelpful. It's very easy, as Harry Dyer said, to fall into the trap of thinking, oh, the youngsters can do it all, we can't, they're going to be better than us, we'll move away from it. But actually, it's not like that at all. And I think one of the things we need to look at in that regard is this whole thing about online and offline as well. I heard one or two people today saying, oh, the problem, you know, children are doing things on their phone during lessons. Um, that aren't to do with what they're learning. Well, I would have to put my hand up and say, I used to do things during lessons that weren't to do with my learning. I didn't have a phone to do it on, but I did them. You know, I might have been passing notes, I might have been drawing on my books, I might have been writing letters, I might have been reading something for, you know, else, but we still did it. But actually, I did also manage to learn. There are things children can do on their phones during lessons, um, that actually might help engage them. And one of them I was talking earlier about, so you have this hashtag up here. I was really interested going into that hashtag to discover how few of you are actually tweeting at the moment. 
if I were at a conference in England, there would be a stream of commentary from the people in the audience appearing on Twitter during the session. Um, that's not an invitation, by the way. You don't need to tell me whether I'm off the point now. I'll find out later. But it's there, you know? And um, Victoria Carrington has been doing some work recently, which she would have talked about, about how contemporary young people understand this business of online and offline. These are some of the things that they have said. Well, she says, generally, you find that the internet and Wi-Fi have merged, and it's so everyday as to be invisible. And they're saying things to her like, I don't think there's such a thing as being offline. I think the online, offline question is just, you know, rubbish. You can still say you're online. Most people are always on, but not in, not signed in. Now it means if you're actually on the things that you're on. So for many young people, there is just no functional version of being offline. The device and the app will accept a notification so that you are, in a way, always on. You know, the text will arrive, the Facebook message will arrive. You may not read it straight away, but it's there. So that these two things become mutually dependent, Victoria would argue. I mean, Facebook and Instagram are dependent on us having real-life activities to put onto Facebook and Instagram. It's because we're chronicling the everyday because we have the offline that we want to share, that we are online. And I think much of our social activity play, takes place now in that context. I've been taking pictures of the rain because I will post on Facebook later something like, what a difference a day makes with my sunny pictures from yesterday. And that amazing storm. And of the, the coffee and cakes saying, you know, this is my idea of a good coffee break, lovely cakes, yeah? So as I live my life, I'm thinking about how I will use that in Facebook. When I'm in Facebook, I'm finding out about how my friends live their lives. When I'm not with them, I'm still with them. And this is not just generational. To say I do this as much as other people. So, so what Victoria's found out is that for people, it's not so much for young people that she's working with that it's online or offline. It's about presence. So they say, if you're on WhatsApp, and there's another person online, you can see when they're typing. The same as on Facebook chat or something. You're both there, and especially when you're having like a conversation about what you're having for dinner that night, or what you're going to do on the weekend, or something, then you're both really present in that conversation. More than, you know, when you actually are physically. I was very struck, this reminded me, um, last year, I finally got together with three of the people I was at school with. We hadn't all been together in the same room for something like 50 years. And so to get together, what brought us back together was actually Facebook. Because we were all on Facebook and we were chatting, we decided to meet. But along the way, we had several evenings where we were all you know, many miles apart but having conversations about what we were going to do on Facebook, on Messenger, while we were all carrying on our normal lives, watching TV, eating supper. So we were online and offline, but we were very present to each other. We had very, very real conversations, which led to us coming together. And at times while we were all together, we were possibly less present because we were all on our phones, sending messages or posting on Facebook to other people. It's a very weird world that we're in, and it's not just generational. I don't know how many other people, the first thing you do when you get to somewhere like this is look for the Wi-Fi code, so you're back online. I think it's much better to think about it as a continuum. Beth Cross did some research some time ago, 2009, showing how play can transcend that offline, online, offline barrier. This was with young children, and she was watching young boys playing online one of these sort of chase around the world killing people games and then taking that into the playground and playing exactly the same game acting it out in real life there was very little difference for them this game was what mattered you played it online you played it offline margaret mackey has done a lot of work on big worlds which in a way i think linked to what you're saying about transmedia the way in which we create a continuum 
If we have a story we like, we build a big world around it. And we will use many media for that. This could be Game of Thrones, you know, when it's, there's the book and there's the very, you know, very, very local, understand some of the filming is, yes, for the actual TV series. There are computer games, there is artwork, there are spin offs, there is fan fiction. All of this helps us to create a much bigger world around the stories that matter for us. But what holds it together is whether it's Game of Thrones or Harry Potter. We're building from the narrative out to make that world, and we will use the media that are available, whether they are online or whether they're traditional. Increasingly, adults are looking for real life play experiences, escape rooms, where you are in this room and you are physically present, but actually getting out of the room involves a lot of digital experience. But there are some contradictions in here as well. An article, this is just a TV reviewer, but she was saying, why is Friends still so popular? And I'm guessing Friends came to Spain. It seems to have gone right around the world. It's certainly in France. And she says, is it partly that these, four, you know, these people living in these you know, apartment building in New York do not actually have an online life? If you go back and watch it, they're just maybe beginning to have cell phones sometimes. There are some scenes where Chandler is proudly using a very, very early laptop. But they're not on Facebook. They're not on Messenger. And she says, is that part of the attraction that young people are seeing people living a wholly offline life? Yet similarly popular, certainly in the UK, the Big Bang Theory, a similar group of people, friends with technology, <clears throat> constantly referencing the online and offline. And that continuum of play, whether they are out paintballing or playing a video game or doing Dungeons and Dragons the old way with dice, play is in there for adults and young people. Recently, we had a very interesting example in the UK of old-fashioned television, a series called The Night Manager. It's based on a Le Carre spy story, and it was completely gripping. But what was interesting was how many of us were watching it at the same time every Sunday night live because we wanted that shared experience of all knowing the next day what had happened. More so, most things will, people will watch when they get round to it, but suddenly we were all back in that world. Huge ratings, and yet at the same time, Netscape, box sets, online DVDs, hugely, hugely popular. So we want it offline and we want it online. There are times when the online encounter can offer enrichment for offline communities. I can't show you um, Facebook shots from this because it's from a closed group that I belong to, Slimming World. This is the kind of constant struggle to balance the enjoyment of cake with staying the size I want to be. Slimming World is one of these organizations like Weight Watchers. You have physical meetings once a week. You talk to each other. You support each other. But those of us who also belong to the closed Facebook group get huge support and encouragement from each other along the way every day. It may be people saying, I'm really struggling, or I'm going to this chain of restaurants, what shall I choose, or I cooked this, sharing ideas. All of those things along the way, moderated because our group leader is in there encouraging us to make a huge difference. That, and again, that is all ages. Yet at the same time, there are people beginning to say, actually, there are some difficulties here. I don't know if you've come across this thing called ghosting. Ghosting apparently is you're in a relationship with somebody um, and you actually want to end it, but instead of saying to them, it's over, you just stop replying to their texts or engaging with them on Facebook. You become like a ghost. And this apparently is the new way of ending a relationship. Well, it seems a pretty uncomfortable way to me. I mean, it's bad enough if they send a text saying, that's it. But just not sending a text, becoming invisible. And then, of course, I don't know whether this was reported. You know there was a hijack uh, plane, the guy who wanted to see his wife or something, and it turned into a terrorist situation. 
But one of the English hostages decided the way to deal with it was to have a selfie taken with himself and the hijacker. And he still thinks it was an intelligent thing to do. Most of us think it was pretty stupid, really, and about self-publicity. But he says, oh, no, I wanted him to realize I'm a human being, and, you know, it would be, I'm not sure that's it. But, you know, these things are there, and we have to say, with each situation, this is the wicked issue. The changing nature of communication, it shows the benefits, but also the downsides of always being in reach. I mean, you think the security for parents, which is often used as the reason for letting them have a phone, but the loss of freedom for the young. You know, for, um, let's just go back a minute, sorry, a little bit fast there. Okay, what I was going to say there before I moved to this slide was, if you think about the gap here and the way it's changed, very, very popular in the UK a few years ago, a bit less now there's pressure on jobs, Take a year out between school and university, or take a year out after university, travel the world. In the old days, when you did that, you were out of touch, possibly for weeks, because you didn't have a phone. If you sent a postcard, it was, well, who knows if it's going to get there. And parents, I'm sure they worried, but they coped. Now, the minute somebody's out of touch for several hours, it becomes a story, and on Facebook, so-and-so is missing. Sometimes that may be true and it may be good, but sometimes maybe it's just changing the way in which we become independent and the way in which we cope with being out of touch and whether that's sometimes okay. So for children and social media, there are good and there are bad. Very interesting, the young boy in the camera story saying, I hope there's a YouTube tutorial. So instantly knowing if you can't do something, it will be on YouTube, how to do it, yeah? Last week, we had leg of lamb. I wanted my husband to bone the lamb, found it on YouTube. If we're stuck, we just Google it, you know, and to prepare this lecture with not all of my books with me in France, Wikipedia was my friend. But then we have this idea of helicopter parents who are always coming in into their children's lives with the excuse of safety, but possibly a loss of growing into independence. We have the dark side of childhood we've heard about today. We've heard about, you know, there is cyberbullying, there is sexting. Harry Dyer, elsewhere in his talk, reminds us about Irving Goffman's theories about social um, interaction, which he summarizes as all the world is a stage, and we all become competent actors in many different contexts. And somebody yesterday, uh, yeah, Daniel Arunda, in his presentation, the wonderful um, young man talking about uh, 12 things he'd learned from video games. And number 10 was, uh, life is a multiplayer role-playing game. And that's the same thing, actually. That's what Goffman was saying. He just didn't know about role-player games to talk about them. And what's that mean to? I think that's probably just, I'm going to go on to the next slide. There are some good things about this um, in terms of our ability to be producers of texts. I don't know about you, but we get online petitions endlessly popping up in the UK. Um, just a couple that have popped into my um, email recently, one about little and resource efficiency. Um, can we make them go green? And in the UK, if you can get 100,000 signatures on a petition, then the House of Commons has to talk about it. And I've actually been part of one that was debated. It's about women and pension age. It didn't make any difference, but they did talk about it. And yet, at the same time, I don't know if you've come across Boaty McBoatface. This is a wonderful story, and it just shows some of the power and the idiocy, I think, of the uh, internet. All right. We have um, a serious research boat being equipped to go... It will be in my saved one, so... This is a, yeah, yeah. To, to, it's a polar research vessel, and they decided the way to find a name would be to ask the public what to call it. They did have the sense to say they would look at those suggestions and decide. Right? But the one that has won hugely is Boaty McBoatface. Yeah? 
And even the person who suggested it voted for something else. But if we go down, so this is this, her, it's, a, it's a royal research vessel, vessel Boaty McVoteface. They haven't said they're going to call it that, but the problem they have is of the top five suggestions, 124,000 people voted for Boaty McVoteface. And the, you know, the first serious scientific one, as a guy called Henry Worsley, only gets 15,000. Even It's Bloody Cold Here gets 10,000, and David Attenborough, 10,000. It's just, where do we go? You know, we give the, the public power, what happens? And some of you will have heard as a, a young English diver called Tom Daly, um, Olympic champion kind of diver. He recently posted this picture of himself on his Twitter feed and said, um, I want to use this picture to create my new Twitter image. Can you help me adapt it? Well, of course, people did. And the first one, of course, was to put Divey McDive face across it. But then there's this wonderful picture of him with, you know, you, you'll have seen the image without that, but, you yeah. Or at the Last Supper, it was Easter, yes. Or my personal favorite with Putin. <laughs> Um, Tom Daly is, is out as gay and the person who posted that one says discussing equal rights like Elton did question mark yeah. uh, you can find out for yourself he didn't choose any of those it's something rather more boring about Rio but just the fact that he gave people those choice it shows something about the ability we have to produce text now because of the internet and yet there can be this illusion of engagement, something we're calling slacktivism in English, in our delight for joining words together. So people post political stuff on their Facebook pages. Let me get to some. Come on. Try that one. That yeah. Some of you will have heard a fairly scurrilous story about David Cameron and a pig. I won't go into it now, but you can ask me later. But so as a result, he gets depicted as a pig in this large sculpture thing in a protest in Downing Street. If I share that picture, am I making a political point or am I just sharing a picture? Similarly with this one, uh, David Cameron was very rude to the socialist um, leader of the Labour Party about it, saying that basically Corbyn needed to get a new suit and learn to sing the national anthem. We have had some stories about Panama yeah, and off land trust. So somebody has changed that to, I know what my father would have said, set up an offshore com company, evade your taxes and sing the Panamanian national anthem. Again, it makes us laugh, we share it, but, and yet, if I can get back to it. This one is about schools. We have this new decision, we should all become academies. This is, I won't read all of this, but it's a kind of sarcastic, why we should, you know, about academies, things like why we should do it, why is it a good idea? The first one, for example, takes schools out of the control of experts and hands them to people who can make money for, for them. And at the bottom, conservatives, if it ain't broke, will make money from it. So yes, again, it's the same thing. We're just sharing it. And yet one of the comments says, I will be using a lot of those arguments in the academization consultation taking place next week. So sometimes it's not just slacktivism. People are saying, I can use that. I can actually use that 
to make an argument. So we come to this wicked issue, and it comes back to young people and text just as much as to us. All of this, is this a sign that actually the internet and being able to produce texts promotes creativity and political awareness? Or are we just guilty of some superficial and mildly amusing plagiarism, you know, the Putin picture, and slacktivism that actually diverts energies away from what really matters? Or is it actually both and? Can it be both things at the same time? And we have to learn how to deal with that. So, and you'll be glad to know I'm nearly at the end. What do teachers actually do? Well, one of the challenges we have is our own. We have to ourselves overcome the fear of the unknown. But this is actually something teachers have been having to do from the beginning. We've all been in contexts which don't necessarily have to do with new technologies, where a child, a group of children, actually know more than we do about something. This is not a bad thing. It is not the end of the world. And it will always happen. We need to embrace that and say, that's fine. You know about that. I know about how we can find out more. Let's bring them together. But it is a wicked issue because we're not going to find it easy. And there will be times when it feels difficult. I argued yesterday that I think there is an issue around technological drift. And somebody today showed a slide saying that the young people thought actually what was going on in schools, the kit wasn't as good as at home. And even if you have iPads and iPhones, each generation does something new. Homes are always likely to be a generation ahead, I think, in terms of school equipment budgets, at least in the UK. So what do we do? How do we deal with that? How do we both exploit the technology and manage the cost? Because it's, you know, Robert yesterday said, well, we can use the children's phones. That's quite tricky. If you go back to what I said about entitlement, will every child in every class have an iPhone 6? Or will some have, if they've got anything, the very elderly iPhone with the broken screen that one of their relatives has handed down? Even my husband's iPhone, which is my old one, I have to confess, we can no longer use the TuneIn radio app on it because it can't be upgraded sufficiently. You know, he can cope, but you know, if he were in school and being asked to do something, that would not feel good. I talked yesterday about the Japanese model where certainly in some primary schools, they seem to just say, well, technology's out there and you can deal with that later. But is that really the answer? I'm not so sure. It seems to me that ultimately what it comes down to is developing critical thinking. If we can actually make the familiar strange, encourage children to question what they're doing with these technologies, ask them to ask themselves some of the questions I've been asking you today, to look at things like the Tom Daly pictures or Boaty McBoatface and say, what's good about this and what's maybe not so brilliant? Then what we're doing is what we've always done best, which is turning children into critical thinkers and the new media become a way to do that rather than the end product. They become a medium, a way to do something. We need to remember where media and medium come from, what that word means, and get back to that. And to finish, two useful sources, and I say this with some embarrassment since I helped edit both, but I didn't write the chapters. This one, which is the book that Victoria and I edited, Digital Literacies, each chapter in here is somebody doing research with young people, and at the end of each, um, the publishers insisted, and actually I think they were right, we put a section called download, which says, what are the key messages of this chapter? What actually does it mean in terms of the classroom, in terms of what research you might do, or what actual work you might do with children? So that each of these research cases is related straight back to school and you can think about what it might mean. And a similar collection, Play, Creativity and Digital Culture, picks up this idea about play. Play as a serious part of learning, and not, as some play theorists would say, 
something where there's real play that you do in real life, and then there's this rather dangerous sort of pretend play that happens online, but something that says play is play. It can happen in different ways. And again, real people working with real young people, your children, to say what things are going on out there and what can we learn from that. But you are also already doing so much. The things that I've heard about, the projects, you know, so many, I don't want to pick out specific ones in a way because there's so much potential there, but I was very struck this morning with the projects, with the Basque political cartoons. We happened to be in our house in France during the whole Charlie Hebdo thing. And it raises some very important questions about what do we really mean by freedom of speech? And of course as well, since our house is in, in Languedoc, which doesn't really think it's part of France, and which has a great deal of empathy with the struggle in this part of Spain, in, in the, with the Catalan view that actually maybe this isn't really part of Spain, those, all those questions about sovereignty, about citizenship, about identity, also are something we can explore. So you're doing so many important things already that I'm almost embarrassed to say what you could do. I hope that this, I know this is the final moment of this project. I hope that it's the beginning of much, much work that will go on in classrooms across all of your countries. Thank you for having me here today. It's been a real privilege. I hope that something at least of what I've said may in some way connect with what you've been doing. Thank you. such an inspiring conference. I think you, you have raised more questions than <laughs> answers, maybe, Good. because it's, it's been plenty of uh, questions. Uh, maybe someone in the, in the room has uh, any question for Professor Robinson. I'll start myself. What do you think about um, the relationship uh, between professors and students and parents outside the school, throughout the network, throughout uh, WhatsApp, Facebook, Twitter, yeah. and so on. Do you have a, a point of view of this? I, I think that's a very interesting one. Somebody mentioned this last night at dinner, and I think the issue really is you, you can't stop parents talking to each other, whether it's on WhatsApp or Facebook. They're going to do it. They used to do it at the school gates, and now they can do it more comfortably, and they can keep those conversations going. So you have to choose, don't you? Do you engage with them and argue back, because it may well be about arguing, or do you pretend it's not happening? It's not easy either way. We had some cases in the UK recently. Um, a head teacher sent a letter home with children to say to parents, could they please make more of an effort in the morning to dress properly coming to school and not come in their pajamas to drop the children off? <laughs> it was a huge, huge debate on Facebook, some of which I saw, because some of the parents said, well, why shouldn't we? What's the matter? And some, you know, it, it just, it was very interesting. And I'm not sure, I mean, part of me thinks, no, of course they should get dressed. And part of me, as a you know, university president, used to say to students who lived on site, no, you're not going to come down to breakfast in your pyjamas with your teddy bear. The other people in the room who are at a conference, maybe the head teachers who are going to employ you one, I, one day, it's not a good idea. But then part of me thinks, if I were in a hurry in the morning and I'd got to get four difficult children persuaded, dressed, cleaned and out of the door, in time to get them to school, would I have time to dress myself the way I wanted? Would this head teacher rather the children were there on time or late because there wasn't time to do all of that and have the parents looking as elegant as they should be? Maybe what it comes down to is saying the world has changed and it's more democratic in some ways than it used to be. And we have to recognize as teachers, our voices are one among many. And we need to listen and engage and respond, not just to roll over and give in, 
but to listen and engage. Yeah? Yeah, of course. And what would be the best uh, choice for you to do at the school um, to teach a uh, like Japanese model that you talked about, uh, to teach uh, with uh, class plenty of technology that sometimes teachers don't even know how it works, to teach with technologies that sometimes is uh, obsolete the day you learn how it really works, mm -hmm. or to, to say, okay, we're going to use these tools here, and now you go to your house and you keep working on with all those tools, despite some of you won't be able to do that because of the economic issue. Mm -hmm. In this um, chaotic uh, reality, mm -hmm. what, is your, uh, what do you think it is uh, the best way to solve this, this issue that it really mm -hmm. is in, in the schools today? I think I'm very glad I've retired, actually, because I think <laughs> it is almost impossible to know. I was thinking about that when I saw oh, the, the photos, the children with um, the cameras, Interestingly, the reason the subtitles were in French was it was shared by a friend of ours in France who had no idea I was doing this. Um, and I saw it and I was fascinated because when I was a primary school teacher, one of the things I did was to actually teach my children how to use old-fashioned 35 millimeter single lens reflex cameras which meant them learning how to load film, to frame shots, to create tape slide sequences, the things we used to do before we had new technology. And there was a huge frustration because you had to wait for the photos to come back and they might have been hopeless. And now with a digital camera, we all think straight away, was that picture any good? Can you take it again? But I think they also got something from using that technology and becoming skillful. So I suspect it must be, again, both and. When we can, if we can use the latest technology in school, then I think we should. There are probably advantages to also sometimes using older stuff and helping children see what happens when something is strange. Going right back to the medieval help desk, one of the things I did when I was teaching trainee teachers about reading, I managed to collect a set of picture books, stories they were familiar with, but in Hebrew. I bought them when I was in Israel. So they're Hebrew translations of well-known children's books. But of course, because it's Hebrew, it works the other way round. The book works the other way round. So you remember the guy, and he can't open it because the book's the wrong way up. Um, Give them this book. Say it's something like Where the Wild Things Are or Gorilla or a story they know really well. But suddenly the book doesn't work for them. They can't work out how to read the stories in the right order because the letters are completely unfamiliar and the structure of the book is different. When we make things strange like that, we have a very interesting learning experience. So maybe sometimes some of that older technology still has a place. And sometimes there's nothing wrong with the Japanese model of it would still help if you could write clearly and we could read what you wrote when you used a pen. And there is time to do those things. So I really suspect there, again, it's a wicked issue. There's no good answer. There's what you can do at the moment in your classroom, which will be the best that you can. But what we need to remember all the time, I think, is what we want the children to learn is not so much how to use the stuff as what they will learn by using the stuff, whether that's about thinking, about narrative, about geography. That's what actually matters. I want them to learn to be able to do this. What's the best way to get there? Does it involve using technology? What's the best way to do it if it does? So it's a bit of a cop-out as an answer to that, so I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for your talk. It was lovely and such inspirational. Um, in this sense, uh, when you talk about uh, the use of technology, why, um, 
why the society almost uh, think that the best way to create this critical sense on the use of uh, of technology of media it's about uh, deeper in this technology and for example what you said about the the knowledge uh, the, the learn code learn how to use code into mm -hmm. the computers why nobody see or pay attention for this another area about the how we use technology not only about the the way we use it i think that's a very good question um I think sometimes we're seduced by technology and we're scared. It's maybe embarrassing to admit that we don't know. I suppose because I'm of the generation old enough to have been made to try and learn basic as this first way of knowing how to use computers in school, that I'm aware of what a complete waste of time that was. And so a very, very wise woman who's an expert in reading in the UK, Margaret Meek Spencer, says um, the thing about information and about literacy is you are fully literate when you know what you don't need to read. And I think with technology, we're still scared to say, I don't need to know that. Because people will think it means you can't know that. So I think partly we, we are, we're scared of admitting, I will say, I don't know how to code. I've done bits in the past, I don't think it's got me anywhere, I'm happy for somebody else to do that. But many people will be scared to do that. And I think also we are seduced, we are told constantly, you know, by Apple, by, by the iPhone 6, by Microsoft, no, 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 have our kits, upgrade to Windows 10, you will love it. I'm Cortana, how can I help you? Well, mainly by going away, please, Cortana, you know? We have these things there. and they kind of overwhelm us. And then I think the other problem for schools, certainly in the UK, is that policy for schools is not set by teachers and by educators, but by politicians. So they find an easy solution. Teach them all to code and our problems will be over because they don't actually understand what they're talking about. People want their lunch now, I expect. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, we'll be here in half past uh, three and have a good lunch. Thank mm -hmm. you very much, Professor uh, Robinson. Thank you, all of you. Thank you.